around 70 miles north of Crete, lies the small volcanic island of Thera, today known as Santorini. Around 1600 BCE, or 3600 years ago, a catastrophic volcanic eruption disrupted the tranquility of the ancient Mediterranean. An unparalleled eruption of the volcano in Thera led to a cataclysmic event that buried the ancient Minoan town of Akrotiri in Sandorini. The settlement was buried beneath meters of thick ash and pumice, which, thankfully to us, preserved it for our eyes. And with that, we have many frescoes that uh, depict women gathering um, saffron flowers or crocus flowers, which is one of our earliest depictions of uh, saffron in history. Hello! This is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Welcome back to another archaeogastronomical adventure with me, Thomas Dinas. On today's episode, we are continuing uh, with our theme of spices and we explore one of the most valuable spices out there. A spice that comes from the stamen of a flower, the crocus flower, with its unique vibrant color and um, difficulty to grow in any large quantities because it comes from delicate flowers and uh, needs to be dried and um, it's hand-picked. It's a very, very expensive commodity and always has been. Sam Bilton is a food historian and author of the book Fool's Gold, A History of British Saffron. And I know her uh, for many years now. We've been following each other on Twitter for since the beginning of this podcast, really, since 2019. And she was one of the first people I started following. We've been in touch um, since then. And um, I'm really happy to have her on the podcast talking about um, her book. Now, she's written uh, two more books. Um, the first one was First Catch Your Gingerbread. The latest one is um, The Philosophy of Chocolate, which uh, she's going to tell us a bit more later on in the podcast. But before we go to our podcast proper, I would like to thank all of my Patreon bikers so far for the help and support and uh, making this podcast happen. And if you'd like to be one of them and help us grow, why don't you join us on Patreon from $3 a month, where you get the podcasts early and ad-free. Also, I would like to add that this podcast can only grow with your generous support, so please share the podcast far and wide with friends and family, and also leave us a review on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, and of course on Acasts and Pocketcasts, and wherever else you get your podcast from. It's really, really important that... Um, you leave a rating and a review, so that will be then suggested and mangled by the algorithms and get distributed to many people who have similar interests. So yeah, um, thank you all so far. And please get in touch if you have any questions about historical food, about ancient recipes, about anything that we discussed in the podcast the past few months. And of course, I will try and um, either answer your questions or make an episode about something that you have in mind and um, all that. I'm on Twitter or X, as it's called now, unfortunately. Uh, I'm there, so you can contact me there as The Delicious Legacy, or you can also email me at the Delicious Legacy Podcast at gmail.com. And of course, you can find also the podcast on YouTube, where I also have got some uh, videos with uh, recipes recreated uh, in modern style. And um, yeah, you can either comment there or you can yeah get in touch any other way you like, basically. You can also follow the podcast on Patreon. You don't have to be a subscriber and you can well, ask questions there too. So yeah, let's go to our podcast proper now. As I said earlier in the introduction, thanks to the volcanic eruption in Sandorini, the Minoan frescoes from Akrotiri, but also from Knossos in Crete, they depict women picking saffron. And also in Knossos we have monkeys uh, uh, also <laughs> picking saffron. So we do know there is a long history in the ancient Mediterranean world regarding saffron. 
By Roman time, saffron was burned in sacrifice. It was also mixed with sweet wine and the resulting sticky yellow mixture was sprayed liberally into the air at theatres and circuses, a custom alluded to by Martial and others. Saffron was also used in an aromatic hair oil, crocinum. This was made at Soli near Coricus and also in the island of Rhodes, an important trading um, hub in the ancient world, midway through, obviously, Asia and Greece and, and communicating with the two halves of the Roman Empire. Typical additives included wine and two other plant dyes, kinabaris, which is called dragon's blood, dracaena kinabari, and anchusa, uh, to adjust the color. In the ancient uh, times, Cilicia in uh, southeastern Asia Minor, a region with coastal plains and mountains, was the most famous for saffron. It was grown there in the limestone depression of Coricus, watered by an underground river. The myth of Crocus from ancient Greece, of course, is very interesting as well. And it tells us about um, uh, the god Hermes accidentally killing his mortal friend Crocus. In his sadness and despair, he decided to give immortality to Crocus by transforming his uh, soulless body into a beautiful mauve flower. And then the blood of Crocus in the three red stamens in the heart of the flower. And every autumn, the, the flowers of Crocus, they fill the earth. We do have a passage from Homer, which gives us a description of Crocus as well, but no more um, details how it was used. Much later on, around the 6th and 7th centuries, the Arabs, with their spread across uh, the Mediterranean, North Africa and Spain, they took with them the the saffron flower, and they spread its cultivation across uh, Spain. And from there, there was a regular trading with the French and the rest of Europe. So we know that um, saffron comes from somewhere in the near Middle East and Greece, and it's a specific flower. And also I know that um, in modern Greece now we have saffron, a specific organic saffron from uh, which has been cultivated near Kozani in north of Greece, central northwest Greece, where near where I'm from. And um, this place, the place is called Krokos, Krokos Kozanis, and produces the saffron there. But um, it hasn't been always the, the case, really. Um, we know that um, this specific cultivation in Greece started with um, local merchants from Kozani that they actually uh, traded with Austria and they brought uh, the cultivation of saffron from Austria around the 17th century. So that's a general overview of uh, the long history of uh, saffron, but let's uh, find out a lot more from uh, Sam Bilton. Enjoy! Sam Bilton, welcome to the Delicious Legacy podcast. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, great uh, to see you again and talk about um, saffron and spices in general, but yeah, specifically about saffron. Why? Because you wrote a book um, recently about um, saffron. I did. So before we go into detail about it and what is it about and all that, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who are you? Uh, what about food and cooking and your books and so on? Wow. Okay. Where to start? Okay. So um, I'm a food historian, uh, but I came into this quite late, you could say. I went back to school after I had my kids and I studied culinary arts at the University of Brighton and decided from there, initially I went with a view to becoming a food writer because I really wanted to write about food. I'd written a lot in my previous existence when I worked in marketing and um, sort of public relations. But I decided that I really wanted to concentrate on food history because it's been a passion. I guess it was a hobby, I suppose, initially, uh, from way back when my grandmother gave me a copy, a really beaten up copy of Mrs. Beaton's cookery book. It's not even the full household management. And inside there was a handwritten notebook. It's a very small thing from her great aunt, Emma, who was passed on to then... Great Aunt Emma passed it on to her daughter, 
Eliza and then eventually it came back to my grandmother. We don't know how. My grandmother doesn't know how. She's she's had it forever and a day. So and that sort of inspired me because it's it's quite a simple thing and very few instructions on how to cook anything, but lots of sort of recipe notes and I we I have done a bit of research and we now know that both Eliza and Emma had worked in service. So I assume it was a legacy from that and that both women have written in it. And it just, I suppose that just sparked that interest in me that I wanted to get into food history. And I've been doing that ever since. Brilliant. Fascinating. It's a very interesting way of um, thinking about it, really. So you wrote a book before Saffron, right? Yes. My first book was called First Catch of Gingerbread, which was on the history of gingerbread. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that was, uh, again, something I've, I'm, I've always loved spices. So it was, I think I just thought, why has no one written a book, a dedicated book in Britain on the history of gingerbread? Or not to my knowledge, there didn't, one didn't exist. And I sort of pitched the idea to Prospect Books and Catherine liked it and said, yeah, go ahead and write it. And then COVID hit. <laughs> So I didn't, it didn't end up being quite the same book as I envisaged it being at the, the start of the process. I had hoped to travel into Europe and go to places like Tehran in um, Poland and some parts of the Netherlands and Germany. And none of that happened, obviously, because of the pandemic. I see, I see. But the book is out. The book is out. I did <laughs> write is... the book. I mean, luckily, the focus was on British gingerbreads, but I had also planned to travel around Britain as well. So again, I couldn't do that. So I lo- a lot of it, had to, I had to rely on secondary sources. And then my travelling yeah. happened latterly. I, I eventually got to Grasmere and queued up at Sarah Nelson's shop and bought my Grasmere gingerbread. And it was, it was quite, it's quite a feat because it was, a, yeah, it was a, a long journey <laughs> to, to taste a particular type of gingerbread, but I'm glad I made it in the end. Great, great, fantastic. So after the gingerbread uh, came saffron, so basically the, the, the subject of, of our, of our uh, conversation today, uh, your book Fool's Gold. Yes. A history of British saffron, yeah. So wh- why Fool's Gold? <laughs> Why the title falls gold? If do, do you want the, I should I should make up an answer for this, you know. The truthful answer is it, it's the title of one of my favourite songs, and I thought mm. it would work well, and it was a working title, Brilliant. and I I kind of assumed that Catherine would um, make me pick something different, but uh, she liked it as well. So yes, yeah, I I really like Falls Gold by the Stone Roses, so I used it as a working title, great. and it stuck. <laughs> great, great answer. <laughs> That's the truthful answer. I never know whether you're supposed to be wholly truthful with, with these things, but that is the genuine God's honest truth in this case. Well, I'll keep it for myself. I won't say to anybody. <laughs> Promise. It's a great track, great. by the way, um, if anyone hasn't heard it. Yeah, good, good, good call. <laughs> so obviously, talking about food and history and all that stuff, do you have a favourite historical recipe? Perhaps something that um, you oh. can share with us? Well, this is a problem, isn't it? It's a bit like picking your favourite child, really, isn't it? It's mm. It depends what mood I'm in. And I know you probably get told that a lot um, by your guests, but it really does. Um, in terms of savoury foods, again, because of my love of spices, I am particularly drawn to 19th century curries, but when they're done well, mm. not the bad ones not the ones that combine uh, sort of bog standard curry powder with lots of flour and a gloopy. But if you, there are a few recipe books out there from the 19th century where, and I'm talking now about the English interpretation of curry or Indian food, so they're not by any stretch of the imagination authentic. But there is one book called, rather unimaginatively, the Indian cookery book. And that has, I think it dates from originally 1881, and that has some um, wonderful recipes in it. The korma that's in there actually did end up in the saffron book, funnily enough, is absolutely beautiful, really lovely. Uh, I can't speak for its authenticity compared to a korma back uh, in sort of India, but uh, in terms of an English take or British take on that cuisine, there's some lovely recipes in there. So that is one of my favourite recipes. I wouldn't say it's my mm. absolutely like. But yet I haven't got any other favourites. But if you had to, pick, if I had to pick one right now, that's one that springs to mind. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, um, 
obviously it depends with the occasion, as you said, you know, yeah. moods change, things you want to do. So obviously we're going to talk about saffron today. And um, one of the things that I remember, I don't know why it stuck to my mind. So saffron, saffron Walden, the place, uh, the town in Essex. Um, I think it was either when I was traveling to go to Thasted Airport, perhaps. Yes, probably. Or yeah. some other some other reason because I like maps and I look at maps a lot and I saw the name Saffron Walden and obviously sounded a little bit exotic <laughs> in terms of uh, like the sound of it. I like the sound, the word Saff- Saffron and Walden together, the sound great in my ears. Um, but also Saffron, I'm come from, obviously, you know, I'm come from Greece, but the North Greece where I'm from near, I'm from Veria, there's a town called Kozani where they grow crocus the flower crocus and they yeah. do saffron and they they have one of the best apparently saffrons in the world um so when i th- saw that i was like saffron in england mm, why what what happened what what's what's in saffron walden and well it's interesting because saffron walden didn't actually start off life as saffron walden it used to be called chepping walden and chepping is the old term for a market market so it may it was that's where the name came from and uh, it, sort of over time it's it's been hard to pinpoint really other historians have tried in the past so there was a lady called Dorothy Cromarty and she did a lot of research into the town's saffron past and she found references to saffron in the court rolls from the 1420s I think And that's sort of the first official reference. But there's no sort of indication of how the saffron was used. Now, they did have a large sheep industry in that area, for a wool industry, I should say. So there were a lot of sheep in the area and the wool was being produced. And so she has made the connection, her mind, she believed that the sheep or the wool was being dyed with perhaps saffron. Mm. Um, and that's why the town eventually saffron, the market became a place where you could buy saffron. So there was a lot of saffron grown in and around Saffron Walden, which is now situated in North Essex. So it's on the border of Cambridgeshire. And actually, if you look over the board in the records in the in Cambridgeshire, that it was grown widely in Cambridgeshire too. So the town just became associated with the spice and eventually in, I think, about 1514, Henry VIII granted the town a charter to change its name from Chepping Walden to Saffron Walden. Um, and, and then they've got a new sort of coat of arms of it. I don't really call it a coat of arm crest or whatever for the town that features the saffron crocus being surrounded by a wall, which is walled in. But I think that, in fairness, the Walden part already existed. I think the walled in theory is perhaps doesn't <laughs> hold much water so we shall we say but so that's briefly right. how it got its name so yeah uh, yeah uh, let's rewind a little bit back so let's um, talk about where saffron is from originally so actually we think that saffron comes from uh i guess you'd call it the near east or uh sort of your neck of the woods really Gr- greece sort of turkey the um with there's been uh, frescoes found on the island of Santorini in Akrotiri. Yeah. And they depict, they, they, it's a beautiful fresco, you can find pictures of it online. Uh, they depict these rather attractive young ladies picking what has been interpreted as the saffron crocus, which I'm sure we'll come on to in a moment about how it's harvested. But it's they're harvesting these flowers. There's also monkeys harvesting the flowers. But as I always say in my saffron presentations, I don't think monkeys are a reliable source of labour in this respect. So um, I wouldn't trust them personally, uh, especially with something as expensive as saffron. But anyway, they're, they're yeah. <laughs> that dates from, I think, about 3,500 BCE. So it's a it's, it goes back a long way, but that's where we think it originated. Uh there is a particular type of crocus that saffron comes from, and it, it only comes from the crocus sativus. No other crocus will produce saffron, even if it has mm. s- slightly long stamens. It has to be that particular type of crocus. And it also only flowers in the autumn, which is often a surprise to people because we're coming into spring shortly, and hopefully we will have lots of beautiful crocuses coming up, but they won't be the saffron-producing crocuses. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so uh, a flower from the Middle East 
and Mediterranean and yeah. kind of warm climes that um, blooms um, uh, flowers in uh, autumn. How how does it work in England? I mean, how, how is well, it possible to be? This is a thing that surprises people because be, yeah, obviously, um, I'm assuming where you've just talked about in Greece, that's probably quite warm and um, quite mild most yeah, of the year. Yeah, summer, summers, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and La Mancha in Spain where it grows and Kashmir, uh, and Afghan, um, Iran, rather. Uh, it, all of these areas are quite arid and quite warm. And then you look at Britain, you think, well, yes, I know nowadays with global warming, we have hot summers, but realistically, we've, we're have we quite a wet, um, mild climate. It's, it's, not, it's not particularly, you wouldn't think, in um, conducive conditions to growing saffron. But it does grow here very well, and it's it's really the question about how it got here because it's not it's not nat- it's not naturalised to this country. It had to be brought here somehow, but it does grow here yeah. very very successfully, and it certainly did in the past, and it's being done so again now. Mm, yeah, yeah, I've heard about a s- s- few people around, and obviously I read on your in your book as well. But um, yeah, I think I, I don't remember where maybe Cornwall. I I, I heard yeah, so about. it's grown down in Cornwall, and it's grown in Norfolk it's even grown as far north as Cheshire it's still grown in mm. Essex uh, in and around Saffron Walden uh, the uh, English Saffron Company do a good job of growing it there it's grown even in Sussex and I can assure you I've tried growing saffron in my garden and I'm on heavy clay and I've had no joy no, but other no parts of Sussex have managed the, the Sussex Saffron Company it's grown in Suffolk as well and Kent. It's yeah, there's quite a number of companies out there now producing saffron in England. Mm, yeah, because we know the Iranian or the Spanish one that is one of the best uh, quality. But obviously, if you if you can grow it here and you can have it very source it locally, probably it's going to be as good, right? Yeah, definitely. It's very good quality. I mean, people often sort of at the uh, price because it's it is expensive but it's you know realistically it should be expensive because it's a, a very it's not a crop that's easy to manipulate in respect of you it has a very short growing season it has to be harvested by hand and that doesn't matter whether you're doing it in La Mancha or in Essex it's the world over it's harvested by hand and then the flowers you from the flowers you have to pick out the stamens which are dry to become saffron the spice so it's is a labor intensive crop to produce and i say it has a short season there's not much they can do to extend the season they are looking at things i believe modern saffron growers like hydroponics but it's it's mm. quite um yeah it's it's quite tricksy in that respect so it's yeah that's why it's expensive but it is worth you know i always say if you're buying cheap saffron you have to ask yourself why it's cheap why it's cheap yeah i mean it was always very expensive let's talk about that it was yeah. expensive from the get-go, wherever people used to trade it, it was an expensive because always it was handpicked. And also, even now, it's more—it's probably the most expensive spice in the world. Then I think the f- second to saffron is vanilla. Yeah, another one that has been hand—you ha- can only hand pollinate it in a sense. So yeah, things that are, they are so delicate, so small, and you hand pick them or pollinate them, and then you dry them, and then they lose weight as well. Yeah, yeah, that, absolutely. That uh, makes it expensive. Yeah. So that's why it's expensive, but it's worth buying. It's it, certainly so. Yeah, it was grown. I mean, say it's, it was in the in the past grown all over the country. It's not, it wasn't just exclusively grown in East Anglia, which is where it's most renowned. So it's it's yeah. it was grown in Cambridgeshire, Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, obviously, and it, a lot of it comes down to the soil you have. So it needs free draining soil. But even I mean, I've just mentioned I can't grow it in Sussex. I've tried. But even in Sussex, I found records going back to the 16th century where it has been grown. So it was grown all over the place. And it was supposed that the the Vale of the White Horse, which I think is Gloucestershire, uh, was particularly renowned. William Harrison even said he, even though he was from Essex, he, even he said it thought it was better from there. <laughs> than Essex. So it's, you know, it's had a history, a long history of being grown in this country. Yeah, yeah. And historically historically speaking, uh, the reasons for growing um, saffron here in England is obviously to use as a dye mainly, or do you think as a spice in food or medicine? I would think the primary reason was initially medicine, 
So again, my research, I started really looking at, because I'm a, a culinary historian, I was looking at its use in food. So I was sort of looking from the medieval period onwards. And there's William Harrison, again, puts the date of saffron production being beginning, although I I suspect it began earlier, between the end of the reign of Edward III and the beginning of the reign, or no, yeah, end of the reign of Edward III and the end of the reign of Edward uh, Richard II. So that puts it between 1377 and 1400. So it's quite a small window. And that, of course, mm. is a lot of that commerce in that period was influenced by the Black Death, which had occurred in the, the mid 14th century. And then there was an opportunity there because there were less people to feed to potentially experiment with different crops, such as right. growing saffron. So yeah, uh, that's kind of where we get that idea. You know, we've got that sort of time frame to work from. But I, I suspect it was probably being grown at some level in monasteries, perhaps, uh, mm. before that date, primarily for medicine. But it, I mean, it has been used as a dye. I believe it's not my area of expertise. I have to say, I did, I did say that quite clearly in my book. I'm like, yeah. don't ask me too many questions about dyeing. I don't really know, don't know much about that uh, sort of textiles and stuff. But I understand sure, that sure. it has been used as a dye in the past, and of course, it was used because it was so expensive. And it such it produces such a beautiful colour. It was used extensively in medieval cookery which is where mm, I guess that's yeah. what sort of triggered my interest in it from a food perspective. I'll be back with Sam Bilton and more stories about English saffron after this short break. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, because it gives all this vibrant colour in food and yeah. we know that medieval and Tudor cooks liked the food to be very, <laughs> very beautiful and ornate and all that stuff. So Absolutely. I guess, yeah, yeah, the saffron has to be heavily used in that period. Um, so you mentioned something about drinkable gold from Tudor period. Uh, is that a, something like a, an elixir or a medicine? Well, yes. So this was, a, there was a, a goldsmith's son called Francis Anthony. And in fairness to Francis Anthony, he did train as a doctor, but there seems to be some dispute over whether or not he was actually recognised as a, a physician. I, I'm not sure they took too kindly to this goldsmith's son coming along and tra- training. I don't know why, but he, poor thing. He invented uh, a potable gold, which he claimed had a, various health benefits it was I mean I believe and he wasn't the only one you if you look in I mean I've got a, a book from Lady Grace Mildmay not an original I've got a copy obviously, but, uh, from the 16th <laughs> century and she talks about that she was quite into her medicines and she talks about this drinkable gold and it was supposed to be I suppose you say an elixir it was it had a variety of health properties that it could help everything from I mean apparently from prolonging your health, but just generally looking after your sort of your heart and just keeping you everything tickety boo. And he mm. he's I mean it's it's quite horrible when you read what they did. They basically dissolved it in sort of acid and I mean C. Ann Wilson says in her books, uh, The Water of Life, that she, you know, it sounds pretty toxic. So uh, I think the idea was you're supposed to have a few drops of this gold. Because the problem with gold, of course, being a metal it, you know, doctors knew that if you ate gold leaf, it comes out the same way it goes in. So there was obviously a desire to circumvent that and try and sort of enhance the properties of gold by making it dissolve. But you can only do that by using some pretty corrosive stuff. So uh, I, I'm pre- I'm, I don't think anyone should abs- absolutely, that's one historical recipe people should definitely not try, or at least not consume if they do try to make it. But he made a fortune apparently from selling this. And he wrote entire sort of, there's books, entire books he wrote based around his theories about this drinkable gold. And I know Mm. um, in France, they actually dug up the body of one of Henry II's mistresses, Diane de Poitiers. And they think that she possibly died from drinking something similar to this, some drinkable gold, potable gold, which was being taken as a beauty treatment, keep her looking young and fresh because she was 20 years older than the king. But yeah, so quite grim. <laughs> I don't, obviously, Mr. Anthony doesn't talk about the, def- the potential lethal side effects in his book. He's, as far as he's concerned, it's just great for you. But yeah. <laughs> right, right. So it wasn't like um, 
we take a few strands of saffron, we dissolve them in water, and well, we drink that with. No, so uh, that, when you go yeah. forward to the sort of later centuries, they, I think, they obviously cottoned on perhaps that drinkable gold was one. It's probably not very easy to pre- reproduce. You still need to get the gold, and that's even more expensive than saffron. And actually, I think it's Eliza Smith has a recipe for a golden cordial which is coloured with saffron, but she puts gold leaf in it and you can shake it and you see all the gold shimmers. So that was sort of a way of (laughs) circumventing the the lethalness. That was just a distilled spirit, which happened to be coloured with saffron. And then added gold leaf to make it a bit like these gimmicky vodkas and things that you can get at Christmas time now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> far too many of them. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so the, the the fashion of uh, putting gold leaf, uh, edible gold leaf in your food, it didn't happen with a uh, Michelin star. <laughs> oh, gosh, no, <laughs> no, no. That's been around. I mean, yeah. that even goes back to gingerbread used to be uh, gilded in gold um, when it was just a posh confection and only the highest members of society were eating it. And obviously when you get further forward in history, they're using a, a copper and zinc alloy called Dutch gold, which is a fake gold essentially but yeah it's it's gold has been used for centuries as a decoration and because it's believed it was believed to have various health benefits Mm -hmm. so yeah there was pretty much an extensive um, industry let's say in in that time um, trading saffron and Producing, obviously, producing, trading, and consuming around England. Yeah. Uh, was it exported at all? Do you know that? Or it was just enough about for, for English consum- well, consuming? Well, um, no, Sally Francis from Norfolk Saffron did some research here, and she ascertained that it was being exported from Norfolk because they were producing an awful lot to the Netherlands. So it has been exported in the past. I'm not mm. sure about now, but uh, certainly mm. in the past it has been been, she found evidence to suggest that it had been exported because they were producing so much in that particular county. Right. And that part of England is has always had uh, connections with um, the Dutch side and yeah. that side of Europe. Yeah, absolutely. And also it's, it's incredibly good for producing saffron. It's fantastic. Mm. It's got the right, absolutely the right conditions. So very free-draining soil, um, quite a dry... Uh, climate yeah. compared to the rest of the country so it's always had that affinity with growing the spice and it continues probably one of the last areas i would think that where it died from where the saffron production eventually died out mm. so having a very expensive product like saffron obviously there's always the, um, the danger of having adulterated product and the fake product um was that uh, quite common in the medieval and tudor eras yeah, so I mean, obviously, because it was expensive, people wanted to maximise their investment, or I uh, frankly just rip off people. So there were various tricks that the saffron growers could employ. So they it used to be dried, as you've indicated at the beginning of the uh, podcast, that it was dried into sort of a a cake, if you like. And once it was dried, it weighed less. So that one of the tricks was to because it was sold by weight was to either drip drip the cakes with candle wax or sometimes butter but butter obviously with downside of that is well even candle wax potentially I guess because it would have been tallow um, is that eventually it would go rancid so that uh, that was something you had to watch out for but also it's, you, they would sometimes mix it with sow thistle or safflower which is still known to this day as bastard saffron and uh, sometimes marigold petals even dried meat fibres were used in the past <laughs> it's really? yeah really dehydrated meat and the way you could test it is obviously if you dissolve if you went to dissolve it obviously it would le- there would be no color coming out of the saffron but also once you put it in water the meat would reconstitute so yeah there were quite a few tricks in the trial i think harrison refers to them crafty jacks that were trying to rip off customers uh, so obviously all this yeah all this played them um, a role in to the price and uh, the trade of saffron uh, but it was important for for many centuries i guess uh, what happened next why did it die down from from the english um, farming let's say well there's a lot of reasons i guess i mean obviously the, the enclosure acts various enclosure acts wouldn't have helped because they were getting rid of small tracts of land and bundling land together so to make larger mm. farms that certainly had an impact on it but i think also Taste changed. 
uh, as well. We were using spices less in food. I know they continue to be used in medicine, but even by the 19th century, they were sort of, there were doubts as to saffron's efficacy as a, a drug, if you like. Um, and also it was just cheaper to import it from overseas. So, right. you know, at Spanish saffron, I think even in the 17th century, was half the price of homegrown saffron. So oh, it, wow. it's it's always been cheap, I guess, because in the Spanish and the Iranians and other countries, even the Greeks could produce larger quantities of saffron and therefore it was cheaper to uh than the stuff grown at home mm, mm. yeah and um yeah we just left with the name saffron <laughs> walden <laughs> but well not- <laughs> yeah i mean that's yeah, the thing yeah. the last saffron of well the last saffron grower that we know of documented was a john knox and he actually did, lived in duxford which is i think in cambridgeshire uh, it's just it's only a, a hop, skip, and a jump from Saffron Walden, yeah. but it's it's technically in Cambridgeshire, and he died in mm. 1829, I believe. But okay. yeah, okay. so he was the last documented saffron grower. That doesn't mean there weren't other saffron growers, but last documented saffron mm. grower, and then of course yeah. it sort of died out completely, more or less, and then it's been revived in the at the end of the 20th century into the this century, the 21st century. Which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, one of the questions I have is, um, I mean, w- I've seen a few recipes uh, with saffron from Cornwall, basically. So what, what is the connection with Cornwall and what's the history here? Okay, well, for some unknown reason, Cornwall is the only county or the southwest of England, because I know some people in Devon will argue they also have saffron buns. But the, the southwest of England is the only part of the country that's retained this a dish that contains saffron. So I did quite a lot of research. I tried to ascertain. I was really hoping to come across some old Essex recipe that contains saffron, but I couldn't find anything that you can categorically say is an Essex recipe that contains saffron. But the saffron bun was once re- eaten all over the country. I'm pretty sure of that because it was like a feast bun. It was a special occasion thing. And But the Cornish have particularly sort of claimed it, I guess, as their own. And I think that's in part because of the legend they have about how saffron arrived in Cornwall. They believe that it arrived there with the Phoenicians. And so the story goes, there was a Phoenician called Himilco. And in 425 BCE, he was tasked with finding an alternative source of tin. Now, the Phoenicians had um, sort of an influence all across the Mediterranean. So they had outposts as far west as Cadiz in Spain, or Gales as they used to call it. And he set sail yeah. from, he went north from there. And I think the idea was originally he was supposed to be heading for Brittany, but somehow ended up in Cornwall instead. And when he got there, he traded saffron for the Cornish tin. And that's how the Cornish ended up with saffron. That's the story. I mean, there's very, well, there's scant archaeological evidence to support this theory unfortunately but uh, yeah yeah that, that's, <laughs> absolutely but you know don't let's not ruin a, a good story with the truth or oh, archaeology <laughs> bless them but uh it's it's a nice story but it, i suspect it's it's probably not the true story but who knows it might have done i mean it was certainly being grown in spain by i think sort of the eighth ninth century and it did spread northwards from there so it's it's not beyond the realms of possibility that if it was the Phoenicians that brought it somehow indirectly Mm. to Cornwall. But uh, I suspect that's where it comes from. But there's lots of superstitions around your... So saffron buns, they were... were, You read accounts from Cornwall where they were sometimes marked with a cross. Now, of course, we know of hot cross buns uh, on Good Friday in in England or in Britain in general. But they... um, but weren't always, they were, could be marked with a cross at all times of the year. Uh, one sort of a household account I read was that, that her, the ladies aren't always did it didn't to ward off evil spirits. And then there was another theory that if you kept one of the, your hot cross buns, hot cross saffron buns, I'm going to add here, aside and left it all year round, you could, it would, if you grated a bit of it into the bowl of an invalid, it would cure illness. It doesn't specify which illness. <laughs> But apparently it would keep every illness. every illness, anything you can imagine. It was it was a cure all. But then, you know, I've heard a similar tale told of regular hot cross buns 
from my As home well, county yeah. of Sussex. So, uh, yeah, who knows? But yes, they do must still make. You can still get lovely saffron buns in in Cornwall if you're down there on your holidays or if you live down there. Um, yeah, so seek them out because they're a beautiful mm, thing. I will do. <laughs> your book, obviously, a part of the history. It's also half of it has recipes about yeah. with saffron. Let's say recipes with saffron. I guess um, that have been interesting to f- try and find which recipes to include and. Um, how the use of saffron in itself in the recipes i mean how did you go about that because it can be very tricky you think to find a recipe that is saffron uh, like has the saffron as a main <laughs> ingredient well i mean the thing about saffron is it is quite a potent spice so one of the things i often get asked is how much is too much because some people really don't like the taste they find it quite soapy bitter sometimes and i think i'm quite generous with my pinches of saffron And I, you know, they ask the other thing: what, how much is a pinch? It's a bit like how much is a handful? My pinch is not going to be the same as your pinch, so there is that to consider. But it, so it is. I mean, some recipes you read had horrendous amounts of saffron, and even I'm like, good grief, that would be horrid and uh, very lurid as well. But anyway, that's a, an aside. How did I find the recipes? Well, it's actually because it was so made such beautiful colour. It was actually very widely used. So even in something like blanc manger, which is By its name, you'd think it was supposed to be white. It's quite often coloured with saffron, bizarrely, <laughs> even as <laughs> it's, it's basic means sort of white food. Um, yeah, yeah, not very white. It's not very white, no. <laughs> not always, but sometimes it's coloured with saffron. So I, I guess I, I did a search on a number of books, key books, and uh, I cherry-picked the recipes that I thought would work or that I could adapt. Uh, one of the things I try to do, I mean, I always try to keep the essence of a dish Mm. But obviously, as you know, sometimes recipes come with incredibly scant descriptions of how to cook them. So there's quite a lot of interpretation some in my book because I want them to be able to be used. It's a cookbook at the end of the day. It isn't, there are recipes in right. the text to provide examples of how it was used, but the recipes that are in the book are recipes that are designed to be made by the people who buy the book. Uh, and cooked in the kitchen. I want people to cook them at home. But the more recent they are, the more likely they are to be a verbatim recipe mm. rather than, I think, probably the biggest liberty I took was uh, there was a, a pigeon recipe. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think it was a pigeon sort of hodgepodge. And I, I've turned that into a, almost a salad. Not almost, it is a salad. <laughs> But I took the uh, inspiration. There's a lot of the same flavors. It's just not. I th- the other thing is a lot of things were cooked in a pot. There are a lot of pottages in history, and there's only yeah. so many pottages that people want in their daily life. So yeah, that's what I've done. So I had to be quite strict in the end and say, well, I want this number of sort of recipes that are meat, this number of recipes that are sweet, this number of baking recipes, and that's sort right. of how I approached this particular project because I could have written a lot more. And there were a lot of mm, recipes yeah. I tested that didn't end up in the book. So Yeah, so there's a, a, an amount of historic recipes that were yeah. adapted. Yeah. yeah. And then obviously some more modern ones. Absolutely. But they they all have, a, most of them have got a seed of inspiration from a historic recipe. Um, mm, mm. But if you, a, a good example of where one where I've literally just converted it is Sarah Harrison's uh, Saffron Buns. And that I have just converted into modern weights and measures, obviously. Uh, and, you know, I, as I always say to people, I don't whisk egg whites for eight hours. You know, I use my Kenwood or my my freestanding What? mixer. <laughs> so, you know, so other mixers are, pl- uh, are available. But, uh, yeah, it's yeah. that, you know, it's that, it's about that particular recipe, the Sarah Harrison recipe, is as it would have been in the 18th century. Except I tell you exactly how long to cook it for, which yeah, is very yeah. helpful, I think, in this day and age. <laughs> so yeah, and that's that's lovely actually because it's got coriander seeds in it. It's very different saffron bun to what we think of the fruited buns mm. that you get in Cornwall now. It's a, okay, it's, that sounds nice. It's got coriander, so it really is a very aromatic bun and not too sweet yeah. either. They make great bacon sandwiches, believe it or not. <laughs> it's okay. it's happening yeah it's got to happen next time it, I've got some time it's happening it's, they make absolutely superb bacon sandwiches so yeah yeah obviously you have some uh, curries as well and some uh, more eastern uh, recipes like from from India and Persia I suppose and all that stuff yeah so I mean a lot yeah. of medieval cuisine is 
highly spiced, as you know, and it uh, has echoes of that sort of Middle Eastern, those Middle Eastern flavours. So I did try also to mix up the eras, but of course, the further in history you go, or the nearer we come to the present day, the less mm. saffron is being used as a savoury ingredient. It's it clings on in you know sweet dishes. So I've got a recipe book from 1915 that I think has got three uh, about five saffron cake recipes or variations on saffron cakes. This savoury stuff, it's really only sort of curries that you start to see saffron sort of by the end of the 19th century. It's not used very much or like a, a Spanish dish, for example. It's not really used in English mm. dishes at all yeah. by then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you have recipes from Greece, from Spain, and from Iran and mm. India that they they are con- more contemporary, let's say, and they use saffron as a savory ingredient. Um, I like the one with the chicken and the hazelnut bread sauce. Uh, that that's really yeah. So I think uh, that's um, the recipe itself was I think 18th century, and I, I did for the sauce certainly was 18th century. I think originally it was supposed to go with. Pheasants, I think. Uh, I think. Mm, uh, okay. I think that, that was the suggestion to serve it with pheasant, but it goes very well with um, the roast chicken. And it should be said that a lot of recipes I've done with a sauce with saffron in as well. Sometimes you, you can separate them; you don't have to serve them together. It was a space thing to sort of bundle things together, like the, that chicken. And it's. I think mm. the glaze I use. I did change the glaze because I did try the medieval glaze, but you don't get the crispy skin. With the right. sort of traditional egg, well, not the way in a modern oven. You may well do if you baste it in front of a on a spit like they used to. Spit, but yeah. certainly in a modern oven, I struggled to get that crisp skin. So I, I ditched the egg yolk in the baste because that's what they used to do in medieval times. They used to indoor roasts with a batter of egg yolk, saffron, and usually ginger um, to make them super yellow and golden. <laughs> but, golden, yeah, 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 golden, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I think it goes really well with chicken. I suppose. And yeah. Something like um like a rice and stuff. Yeah, it goes really well. And um yeah, there's another very nice one with uh, milk and garlic and saffron, like marinated chicken thighs. I believe that, yeah. that was really nice as well. Yeah, I think that that works really well too. Yeah, that that's that is a lovely one. That is a medieval dish, and that is actually an example of one where I've I've re. I mean, with that, with very basic instructions. I've tried to keep it as far as I as I'm concerned without literally cooking mm. it over a fire. I've tried to keep it as faithful as possible. But the ingredients in that that recipe does exist. I think it's from the former curry or two fifteen century mm, okay. cookbooks. But it's it's out there. Yeah. So that that is a proper medieval recipe. And it's good. It has got quite a lot of garlic in. Perhaps not one for Valentine's Day if it's, a, if it's your first date, but uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe not the first date. But no. if you both eat garlic, then yeah, well, yeah, yeah if you're both eating, I yeah. guess it doesn't matter, does yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> I love garlic. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love garlic yeah, too. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd, I, yeah, something else I couldn't live without. I think garlic and cheese. <laughs> there we go, Sa- savory stuff. Yeah. Still savory, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Excellent. So, basically, I guess, yeah, we kind of um, talked about um, the res- some of the recipes in the book and which ones are kind of your favourite ones here too, right? Uh, you you kind of mentioned the ones that you find more. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to pick one, but I say that uh, I mean Sarah Harrison's saffron buns. I'm particularly fond of because I think that was an absolute. That was sort of one of those revelatory moments when I made them because I was like, oh my God, these are absolutely delicious. I've never, I've had caraway cake before, but I've never, and I put gingerbread in some of my gingerbread recipes are coriander, but I'd never have thought of coria- uh, coriander seed in a in that sort of context. Because again, it's quite, I think of it as being quite an exotic spice, but that was also, and still is grown here uh, in Britain in some parts. Yeah. So, yeah, that's probably one of my recipes. But then, you know, I think back to all of them, the chicken ones you've just mentioned, they're all lovely. I only put the nice ones in. I didn't put any of the horrible ones in. They obviously didn't see the light. <laughs> they didn't see the light of day, clearly. They're, they're, they got, Could you imagine? They're on the, the uh, kitchen floor, so to speak. But, yeah. But... <laughs> lovely. And um, what's the future of English saffron? Well, it's, as I say, he's being grown again uh, in this country and there's a number of producers as well which is encouraging um i think you know providing people support these local industries it should continue to thrive 
As, as far as I know, most of it is being grown as a culinary ingredient. I don't think it's being used as a dye. I don't think that much, enough of it's being produced, but I, I couldn't swear to that. But yeah, it's, they're, they're doing well all right, I believe. It's, you know, they, Britain has its challenges with its erratic weather. So it's, uh, but, the, you know, they're managing to survive all these foibles that are coming their way in terms of heat waves and droughts and then too much rain. And But yeah, it's growing well. So, yeah, you've got sort of, I said, companies all over the country that are growing it, you say, even as far north as Cheshire. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks for that. Sam Bilton, thank you for coming to the podcast and thank you for all the fascinating aspects of English saffron. No, you're welcome. That you shared with us. Yeah. So tell us, um, Saffron was uh, your second book, uh, Fool's Gold. Yes, that was my second book. And you have uh, another one out now. Yeah, so last year I published the Philosophy of Chocolate with the British Library. It's part of their Philosophy of series. So it's a very short book on the history of chocolate. It was quite a challenge to condense the history of chocolate from its discovery um, or its pre mm. sort of early roots in Mesoamerica right up to the present day into 15,000 words. So it is a, a very much a snapshot of chocolate history, but it was great fun to write. So it's, uh, I hope, you know, any listeners who want to buy it, I, I thoroughly recommend it. Or if you know someone who loves chocolate, it's, it's definitely a book to give to someone who absolutely adores chocolate. So it's very easy to read. It's not too heavy. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And um, we can also tell uh, the listeners that you have a podcast as well. I do. I do. I have a podcast called Comfortably Hungry. And each season I have a different theme. And this season I'm currently working on is not surprisingly on chocolate because of my book uh, and because I did so much research and it was such an interesting subject and I couldn't get everything in the book. So this yes. the podcast is my opportunity to cover some things in greater detail that perhaps weren't touched on mm -hmm. in the final um, publication. And uh, yeah, you can find that on all your usual sort of podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, Google. And um, yeah, I hope everyone would like to listen to it. And at the end of it, I should say we, my guests bring a dish to uh, a potluck supper. It's a virtual potluck supper. We don't actually get to eat them, unfortunately, because we do most of our recordings over Zoom. But it's quite fun. So by the end of the season, I have quite an, a sort of a, an eclectic variety of dishes for people to sample in theory. <laughs> Yeah, and you can you can also subscribe to it via Substack. I've got a sort of a newsletter that accompanies the podcast on Substack. Brilliant, thanks, um, listeners. Just um, tune in and find the podcast. It's really interesting, both seasons actually. Uh, looking forward to listen to the new episodes about chocolate. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode all about saffron, and. Um, It has inspired you to create some amazing recipes with it. It's a beautiful spice and goes really well with rice as well. So if you make uh, some Persian rice, do include saffron. It's very expensive, I know, but also small amounts can do the job. And of course, it's worth its weight in gold. Please buy saffron from reputable sources and not get conned with um, cheap imitations and uh, saffron that isn't actually saffron, and that will disappoint you even more. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Thanks for listening. See you soon. Mm -hmm.